Hello and welcome. My name is Patricia Terrell with the American Physiological Society, also known as APS. The title of today's workshop is Method to Assess Blood Pressure Regulation in Humans and in Animal Models. This is sponsored by Dr. Phil Griffiths of AD Instruments and chaired by Nina Stachenfeld of Yale, of, uh, Yale School of Medicine and Lacey Alexander with Pennsylvania State University. Before we begin, on behalf of APS, I would like to thank everyone who registered for this workshop. We had 519 pre-registrants and we're looking forward to most of you joining us uh, today. This morning, um, I would also like to thank you for your awesome support. Thank you for our sponsor, AD Instruments, all volunteers, the joint program committees, session organizers, and speakers for assisting us for organizing today's workshop. And now for a few housekeeping notes. The session will be recorded and available on demand during EB 2021 and through May 31st. Um, also, we wanna make sure that to maintain the scientific integrity and respect towards our colleagues, your colleagues, we ask that you refrain from photo or video capture of any scientific presentations in whole or part recording or taking photographs of another person's presentation without their explicit permission is prohibited. At this time, all attendees except the speakers and the uh, chairs are in listen only mode. You may ask questions using the chat feature and in the Zoom window, which is located at the bottom of your screen, I'm sure we all know this by now, uh, but at the end of each talk, the session, share, session chairs will read the questions to the speakers. You do not have to wait until the talk ends before placing your question in the chat. The session will end approximately at 11.15 because we wanna allow time for our sponsor to say a few words. Your feedback will assist us, so feel, feel free to email us if there's any questions you have regarding uh, the sessions or the questions that may not have gotten answered. So it is now my pleasure to pass the baton to Dr. Nina Stachenfeld and Lacey Alexander, who will moderate today's workshop. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. As Patricia just told you, the title of this session today is Methods to Assess Blood Pressure Regulation in Humans and Animal uh, Models. And on behalf of uh, Lacey Alexander and I, I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I also want to take a minute to thank uh, all of our uh, uh, first responders and the many people on the front lines who've worked so hard to get us through this pandemic over the last year. Many of us have uh, sacrificed a great deal, uh, ranging from those people who've helped us uh, get through at the supermarkets, to the physicians that have been saving lives, to those of us who've sat in our laboratories and attempted to get through as best that we can. I wanna make sure that we recognize those people as we continue to muddle through this very difficult time. I also want to point out for a minute that it's so exciting to see our women participants included in research and leaders in the laboratory, and to remind everybody that women have been at the forefront of the world's response to COVID-19. And this is done despite constant multitasking, inconsistent institutional support for family care and career costs. And I also want to mention how exciting it is to see in our own talk today how uh, most, of, uh, most of the uh, speakers today are women, and this is a movement that's very much supported by the American Physiological Society, and we're so excited to see this. And our uh, one um, male speaker, Vaughn Macefield, is and ha always has been an extraordinary supporter and mentor and sponsor of women throughout his career. So I, I, I just want to take a second before we get going into this to remind us uh, how important this is, uh, not only to APS, but to me personally. And so without further ado, I'll begin these workshop talks. And the, uh, I'm not going to list them here, but because we'll introduce each one individually, but I'll start with, this, uh, the, with the first one, blood pressure measurement in freely moving rats by telemetry. This is the gold standard method. This is uh, given by Noah Shockey. 
and she comes to us from the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Shockey. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay. So, uh, depending on your time zone, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee for um, inviting me for this uh, talk so that I can share my experience with this gold standard method uh, telemetry in 3D moving rats. Um, so, let's get started. So the techniques used for uh, blood pressure measurement in experimental animals are really divided into uh, either the indirect methods, for example, the tail cuff method, or the direct me methods, uh, and those include either the catheters or catheters or the radio telemetry. Now let's talk about uh, the radio telemetry more. So basically, this method is um, uh, the implantation or the surgical implantation of a small biocompatible uh, radio telemetry uh, transmitter or a probe as we call it um, surgically inside the animals um, and as you can see here on the left side of the screen uh, this is how the transmitter looks like there is the catheter part which goes inside the artery of the rat and there is the device body which basically does have the, the battery and then there is the suture rip which you use uh, when securing the device inside the body once you insert this surgically inside the rat, you can, uh, it does transmit biological data that is located by uh, the receivers, uh, which are outside the rat, and then the receivers send the signals to uh, the computers, and the computers, as usual, uh, do the magic stuff and give us numbers for blood pressure. Um, and this uh, distal part of the catheter, which is uh, magnified here, is really a thin-walled part, and this is a very important part in your procedure, keep it in mind, and it does have a, a biocompatible uh, gel layer in the tip. Just keep this gel layer in your mind, so I'm going to talk about it a couple of slides later. Okay. The process of measuring blood pressure by telemetry is divided into three steps. Before implanting the radio telemetry transmitter, the surgical implantation of the radio telemetry transmitter, and the actual measurements and data collection. Uh, so if we start by uh, before implanting the radio telemetry transmitter, before implantation of the radio telemetry transmitters, uh, there are a couple of steps that you need to do. If you can see on the on the right side of my screen, this is how a radio transmitter looks like in in the real life. This is the thin old part. Um, and on the tip of the thin walled part is the gel layer that I was just mentioning. This gel layer needs to be intact, doesn't have any air bubbles. So if you happen to have an air bubble as the one that I'm having here, you need to get rid of this. And this is what we call re-gelling the probes. And then you need to run the offsets or calibrate them to make sure you account for this um, in your data. And then you sterilize them overnight in a cold sterilized solution. Now comes the, um, the surgical part or the surgical implantation of the radio telemetry transmitters. And people really do this uh, by different ways. Some people do uh, femoral artery implantation, others do carotid artery implantation. But the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is the abdominal aorta implantation of the transmitters, which is a very commonly used method and is the one that we have been uh, using in our lab for the last couple of years. And since uh, we are not really allowed to take of our rats. So I'm going to use those uh, screenshots shots from um, a video that is posted on YouTube free, free for everybody and I can share the, the link with you guys. It's uh, really very useful to watch. So um, you need to first give your rats a uh, preoperative analgesic. We use carprofen 5 milligrams per kilogram sub Q and then anesthetize your rats with isoflurane and oxygen. Go ahead and place it on the table in this way and shape the abdomen and swap it with betadine. Then you need to make an abdominal incision. Um, use your sterile gauze or Q-tip applicators to start moving uh, the organs aside a little bit until you can visualize the entire length of aorta. You need to be seeing the aorta from uh, the iliac bifurcation caudally until the left renal artery and vein uh, cranially. And for those of you guys who have not done surgeries in rodents and have not seen uh, blood pressures, uh, blood vessels before, the, the lighter color one or the brighter one is the, 
is the, uh, the artery and the dark red one is the vein. So this is the aorta and this is uh, the vena cava. And on your right side here is the, the left renal vein and artery of the rat. And hopefully you can appreciate here, this is the iliac bifurcation caudally. So if you can see the iliac bifurcation and you can see the left renal artery and vein, then you are in the right spot. Now I'm gonna use this cartoon uh, to explain more of the details of the surgery. You will need to uh, put in place your occlusion sutures, and you need to put this in two spots. The first spot is caudal to the renal vein, and the second spot is cranial to the iliac bifurcation. Um, so what you do is that you use your vessel dilator to make a small gap between the aorta and the vena cava in this spot. Um, and then you pass your 4-O or 5-O suture uh, between the two vessels so that it lies underneath the aorta. Again, you do the same in this spot, but be extremely careful not to puncture your uh, vena cava because really here, part of the vena cava runs behind the aorta. Once you made those two gaps and passed your sutures, uh, you can also go ahead and place um, clamp. And the reason you use the clamp and the occlusion sutures is to partially occlude the blood flow when you are making your incision. Um, you will need a catheter introducer and I simply use a 23 gauge uh, syringe needle and I bend it to a right angle as you can see here. Now when I have this I am ready. Um, so I occlude my artery, I use the clamp and the sutures. Um, then I go ahead and make the incision with the needle and I keep it in place uh, so that it acts as a guide for my catheter. Then I hold the catheter with a catheter tweezer and I go ahead and insert it in the aorta and advance it cranially until the entire thin walled section of the catheter here is inside the aorta. Um, so at this point, this is what you have. You have the thin walled um, part of the catheter, which does have the sensing region inside your aorta between the levels of your renal veins uh, cranially and the iliac bifurcation caudally. If you have this, then you are good to go. Um, now you need to dispense a small amount of uh, adhesive. I use the bed bond to seal the vessel. Uh, give it a couple of seconds to make sure that it, uh, it is well sealed and then release the blood flow and be very cautious um, in case it's still bleeding. And then if you don't have bleeding, go ahead and return all the organs to their place. And the device body should be positioned inside the peritoneal cavity uh, and the suture wrap should be included in the, in the suturing of the abdominal wall. Uh, once you have done this, you are ready to suture the skin. And this is the video that I mentioned earlier. I'm not gonna show it, uh, but you can refer to it after the workshop. Um, now the rats are allowed for uh, recovery. You can discontinue your anesthesia, keep them on the warm blanket until they recover from uh, their anesthesia. And then um, you could administer post-surgical analgesia, monitor them to make sure that they return their normal postures and behavior, and then allow them at least two weeks to recover from the surgery before you start recording their blood pressure. And I would like to point out here that in the past, when we used to go for shorter time periods, at least shorter than 10 days, we used to notice a drop in blood pressure rather than a consistent blood pressure. So please be aware that you need two weeks at least uh, for recovery. Now the party time, right? Uh, we are all excited. We have done the surgery, which is the hard part, and we want to collect, start collecting our data. Uh, and I would like to point out here that uh, when I first started doing this, I had had a very naive question that I I'm sure that since I did ask, then somebody here should be asking too. Well, I did put my transmitter inside the rat. How can I turn it on now, right? So the answer is really very simple. Uh, it's just you use the magnet and you approach the magnet to the body of the rat, to the abdomen, since it's an intra-abdominal uh, catheter, um, and it just it turned on the, the transmitter. So this is the setting that you have right now. You have your rats. The rats do have the, the transmitter inside the uh, peritoneal cavity. The device body is in the peritoneal cavity. The catheter is in the aorta. The rats had the surgery and recovered and they are housed in their cages, freely moving. The cages are placed on receivers and receivers do send to the data exchange matrices, which does transfer the data to the computers and the computers do the magic as I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, this is the setting that I worked on when I was working as a postdoctoral research fellow um, at the University of Mississippi uh, Medical Center. I was honored to work with Dr. Jane Rickelhoff, who had this amazing setup for blood pressure. Every single one of those is a receiver. 
um, and those are the messages here. <clears throat> so really, depending on the number of receivers that you have and the number of data exchange matrices, you can detect blood pressure signal from whatever number of rats um, simultaneously. Now you did the surgery and you allowed your rats to recover, you are ready to collect your data. Okay, how do I know that I did a great job? In order to answer this question, I'm gonna introduce you to how the arterial pulse waveform looks like. Really, the waveform is separated into three distinct components. The systolic phase, which is here, uh, and is characterized by a rapid increase in blood pressure, followed by a rapid decline in blood pressure. And this really corresponds to the, the, the contraction or the ejection of the left ventricle and the, the opening of the aortic valve. This is followed by a transient, uh, but a sharp drop in blood pressure called the dichrotic notch here, and this represents the closure of the aortic valve. Then there is the diastolic phase, which is characterized by a slow decline in blood pressure, and this really represents the runoff of the blood to the peripheral circulation. So this is how the waveform looks like by the book. The question is, uh, what happens in the real world? Um, so in order to make sure that you did a great job, you need to make sure that your signal does show the systolic and the diastolic phase. You can see those. Um, the dichrotic notch is really very challenging to see. I don't think you'll be able to detect it, but it, as long as you see the systolic and the diastolic phases in your signal, then you are good. And this is how an actual signal looks like. Uh, you should be able to magnify this. So every single waveform of those corresponds to one beat. This is the rapid increase and the rapid decrease, um, um, which correspond to the systolic phase. And then this slows down. It still declines, but at a slower rate. So this is the slow decline, which represents the diastolic phase. Um, so we have the systolic and the diastolic. And I really call this shape like it's a, a mountain that does have a tail. So as long as you have this mountain with the tail for every single uh, waveform of those, then you are good to go. The next thing that you need to double check is your pulse pressure. You need to have a pulse pressure that is between 30 and 50 millimeter mercury. This is how you can tell that your signal um, is okay. Um, now I'm talking about wild type rats because it has been reported that some, of, some kinds of manipulations affect your pulse pressure. This is, those are not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about your wild type rats. They should have a pulse pressure between 30 and 50 millimeter mercury. Okay, so your surgery is good. Um, now you, wanna, you want your data. It depends on the type of software you are using. Um, this uh, the screen will look different, definitely. But I believe the components will stay the same. For example, you have numbers here. Those are the serial numbers of the transmitters that you are using. You have the option to choose which transmitter you want to uh, review the, the data from. And then you have an option to choose what kind of signal you want. We normally choose the blood pressure signal. And then you also have an option to choose the time range. And I strongly advise everybody um, to check on the rats daily and save the data daily. So as you can see here, I'm saving the data from January 31st until uh, February 1. So it's just every day I go ahead and I save my data. And I also save it from 11 a.m. to 8 a.m. And I skip the first three hours in the morning because those are really the hours where the animal facility staff come inside the room, they may make some noise. So this may disrupt, um, might disturb my rats a little bit. So I always like to avoid those three things. And then the software saves your data in an Excel file. And as you can see here for every single hour, 11 a.m., 12 noon, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and so on, for every single hour, you have a reading for the systolic blood pressure, diastolic, mean arterial pressure, and heart rate. And then you can average all of those, the 21 readings uh, from the whole day, or you can average the light cycle, or you can average the dark cycle, you can average the pulse pressure in the light cycle or the pulse pressure in the dark cycle. It really depends on what you wanna, uh, how you wanna present your data. So those are um, some examples of, uh, of data that people have reported with telemetry before and we have used. And I'm sure that uh, other users using the telemetry system have done um, much more than this, but those are just uh, some examples. For example, people use it to uh, record the mean arterial pressure, systolic and diastolic blood pressure daily. And that on your right side here, as you can see, uh, this is an, uh, a paper that we published last year. We had four groups of rats and we measured their blood pressure for four consecutive days. Here we are reporting the mean arterial pressure, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Um, no manipulation here, it's just that the four groups were different. 
another example is people measuring the, the baseline blood pressure and then the blood pressure responds to a certain manipulation, for example, a certain treatment or a certain surgical procedure, whatever they want to do. So they record the blood pressure baseline daily, and then they go ahead and give their treatment. For example, here I gave enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor that does drop the blood pressure. The data was negative. It did not have a, difference, a different effect on the two groups, but still dropped the blood pressure, and I reported that. The third example is uh, people who are interested in the circadian rhythm and they want to report the, the changes in blood pressure in the light versus the dark cycle. Um, and as you all may know, the rats are uh, nocturnal animals. They wake up at night, they eat at night, drink at night, you know, do all the, the stuff at night, and then they sleep in the morning. So normally their blood pressure at night is higher than in the morning. And hopefully you can appreciate this from the figure here, that the values in the dark cycle are slightly higher than the values in, in the light cycle. And then you can do whatever manipulation you want to see the effect on both the dark and the light cycle. And last but not least, some people uh, use the telemetry to study the baroreceptor sensitivity, which is really a relationship between the change in the blood pressure and the, the pulse interval or the change in the heart rate. Since you do have a blood pressure value for every single uh, heartbeat, then you should be able to also calculate your uh, baroreceptor sensitivity. Okay, so why is the telemetry the gold standard method? The answer to this is really in the advantages of this method. Number one, it does allow you to measure the blood pressure without handling or restraining your animals. So there is no stress. And this is definitely unlike what happens in the tail cuff method, and also unlike what happens in the catheters, or at least some of the people using the catheters. And you may doubt this and say, well, it doesn't have restraining or handling, but it does have the, the big stress inducer ever, you know, it does have the surgery. Uh, but I will tell you that the two, hour, the two weeks that you allow for recovery is really uh, enough for the rats to recover from the stress induced by the surgery. Now, the second advantage is that it allows you to measure the blood pressure in the conscious animals, which is definitely a very big, uh, big difference between measuring the conscious animals and anesthetized animals. For example, what some people do with the catheters when they anesthetize the rats and go ahead and measure with the catheter. Um, it also allows you uh, to continuously measure the blood pressure. As we saw, you have 21 readings for 21 hours a day, and you can also have 24 hours a day if you want to. And again, this takes us to the fourth one, where it allows you to monitor the highly dynamic nature of the blood pressure in a very comprehensive manner. And th this is really because you have a blood pressure value for every single heartbeat. Um, now comes the disadvantages. It does require skills to place the radio transmitters inside the, um, the artery, whatever artery it is. But the good news is um, it is not really a mission impossible kind of surgery. It is a doable surgery with um, some training. So you need some training, but you should be able to uh, get skilled in doing this. Now, the other one is that it requires expensive equipment, right? You are going to spend all your money uh, doing this, uh, but I believe it is uh, worth it. The third one, which I like to point out because it has been uh, a big story, at least in, in the past couple of years, which is the drift. And the drift is really the, the change in the offset of the radio transmitters by time. So if you have a long-term experiment, let's say a three months experiment, and you put your uh, transmitter inside the rat, by the end of the experiment, you had a 10 millimeter mercury change. However, when you redo the offsets after the experiment, you find the offset changes by millimeter mercury. So you don't really know if that change was experiment induced or transmitter induced. However, I think this problem is really well taken care of by the manufacturing companies right now because we, we no longer have this. The, the transmitters are very much uh, stable in their offset. Um, those are some resources that I wanted to share with you. This is the video about the abdominal aorta again, the cannulation and the um, the device placement. This is a very nice video for the carotid artery cannulation for those who want to insert their transmitter in the carotid artery. And those are other resources for how you choose your method for blood pressure measurement if you are doing uh, experimental animals. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you all and I'm open to your questions. Uh, thank you. Do you want to uh, stop screen sharing? And uh, so there were some questions that came in yes, during, uh, during that excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, that um, 
the first question uh, that, that uh, came in, I think you answered it a little bit, uh, uh, that, ha that does have to do with the comparison between this method and the tail cuff method um, that we see a lot. Uh, and I think the, the uh, a main reason that people are interested in the tail cuff method is likely the expense. Would, would you say that? Um, are there other reasons than you just mentioned to use so, it to, uh, to, or to switch to this method than, uh, rather than the tail cuff? So people um, sometimes prefer the tail cuff to number one, avoid the surgeries um, if they don't really have the skills or they don't want to go through the process of learning the surgery. So they want to avoid the surgery. That's why they use the tail cuff. Um, some of them really um, have the, the financial problem where they want the less, the less expensive uh, equipment. However, the, the, they have to be aware that the tail cuff does have a, a couple of disadvantages that are really, uh, you know, if you just need to be aware of them, then you can choose your method depending on what you want. The, the tail cuff induces um, stress because number one, you handle the rats right before you um, you put them on your uh, restrainer and then uh, measure their blood pressure. So you handle them. This is a stress. And then you put them on a platform that is heated to 37 degrees. Uh, just you need to, to raise their core blood pressure, temp uh, sorry, their core temperature uh, so you can dilate their um, tail vein and be able to detect a signal from the tail. Uh, that is also a stress. It's a thermal stress. And then you restrain them. You put them in a restrainer, a small box. Um, to avoid their moving because when they move, you really get artifacts and the software may stop recording. Um, so that is another stress, a restrainer stress. So all those kinds of stress affect your uh, reading. There is, um, it has been reported that people do um, train the rats or their animals in order to get them used to it, but however, the, the value is very questionable. Another main problem with the, with the tail cuff is the timing that you do it. So normally people really do it in the morning when they go to the lab, right? Uh, and as I said, the rats wake up at night. So it's like you are waking up a human being in the middle of the night, like we are doing now to our uh, friends from Australia. Wake them in the middle of the night and then take them, put them in a, in a, you know, in a box uh, and heat them, warm them up. Uh, to raise their, to dilate their vessel and then go ahead and measure their blood pressure. That's what we do with the uh, tail cuff method. However, it is good in detecting the big changes in the systolic blood pressure. So if you are really expecting big changes and big, what, what I mean by big is something that is more than 10 millimeter mercury in rats at least. Uh, uh, then you can use the tail cuff method. Uh, that's the only, according to the AHA recommendations. Um, another question that just came in, and uh, this might relate a little bit to expense, was can these uh, probes be reused? Yes. So the, I'm going to talk about the probes that I personally have used. Not sure about all the, the other probes, but the ones that I have used have a battery life of 150 days. Um, so if you have an experiment that lasts for 30 days um, and you uh, are taking good care of your probes when you are inserting them, making sure you don't really touch their thin walled part and you regel them as appropriate, you can keep reusing them from rat to rat um, until you are approaching the 150 days, let's say 140 days or you know, to be on the safer side, 135 days, something like this. Okay, and I think we have time for, unfortunately, uh, we only have time for one more question. And um, I thought it was an interesting one. Uh, there, there was a question that came in, was whether there were uh, any differences between the um, ephemeral or abdominal measurements. You mentioned that you can do this either in the abdomen or the femoral artery. Yes, uh, that is a very good question. I believe that the difference is really in the technique that you do and in the purpose of your experiment. So, for example, we came across time when we wanted to measure blood pressure in pregnant rats now or measure, put the, uh, the telemeters in and then induce pregnancy. If you want to do this, then it is really uh, not an option to, uh, to do the abdominal aorta because the probe will be inside the abdomen and the, the uterus is already there, plus you do... Um, um, you do decrease the blood flow to the iliac bifurcation, which is really a main supply to the uterus. Uh, so you may induce uh, low birth weight infants or something like this. So if you want to do a pregnancy in your rat, then you will need to either do a femoral artery or do a carotid artery. That's an example. So it really depends on your purpose of the experiment. Uh, that's how you choose the way. Uh, if the signal itself looks different or the values look different, I don't think so. However, I'm not 100% sure because I've not used uh, the alternative methods.
Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, we're going to have to move on. I did want to share before uh, we move on that David Pollack has been kind enough to share a number of websites. Uh, and I think these relate to a question that came in about the brands that, um, and David Pollack as well from, uh, and his, from his, um, from the AD Instruments has uh, some brands available. And uh, so if you're interested in where to get equipment uh, to do these kinds of experiments, go check out the chat and take a look and you can uh, uh, get that information there. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll move on to uh, uh, Dr. Alexander's talk, the use of skin microdialysis to elucidate mechanisms of blood pressure regulation in humans. Thank you, Lacey. Great, thank you so much, Nina. And I'd like to thank the APS for sponsoring this session and also um, say what a pleasure it is to be presenting with such a wonderful group of people on the panel. So today I'm going to talk about the use of skin microdialysis or intradermal microdialysis and its utilization for elucidating some mechanisms pertaining to blood pressure regulation in humans. So um, when we think about human skin blood flow uh, and blood pressure regulation, I think we have to go back and look little bit at some of the um, purpose and, you know, consider that uh, the skin is a thermoregulatory organ, um, such that during times of cold stress or systemic cold stress that we see a profound vasoconstriction, uh, shunting blood to the core. And then conversely, we see during heat stress or when we have increases in body core temperature, a tremendous increase in blood flow to the skin uh, to serve for thermoregulatory purposes. So here um, in this figure, we have skin blood flow along our y-axis and time in minutes along our x-axis. And what you can see is that during a time of cold stress, we see profound vasoconstriction, um, whereupon then we see a period of heat stress where we see this release of vasoconstriction and then uh, a threshold where then the active vasodilator system ensues. So when we think about the neural control of human skin blood flow, we have to consider both the sympathetic regulation from sympathetic adrenergic nerve fibers, as well as a uh, sympathetic cholinergic active vasodilator system. And if we see the line, the dotted line indicated um, with surgical sympathectomy, um, we see that uh, resting skin blood flow approximately doubles. So under um, normal thermoneutral conditions, uh, skin blood flow is, um, we're under a chronic adrenergic uh, vasoconstrictor uh, tone. Um, additionally, uh, the cutaneous circulation is on the efferent arm of the barrel reflexes. So this is some old data, um, both from Larry Rell, um, as well as when John Johnson worked in Larry Rell's lab as a postdoc. Um, and this is uh, during a perturbation with lower body negative pressure. So as you can see, as you're unloading at a minus 30, so unloading the cardiopulmonary baroreceptors uh, receptors, as well as um, greater lower body negative pressure at a minus 50, that there is a profound vasoconstriction that occurs in the skin. Um, and uh, when we block that, so um, under this condition with, with the, the figure by Rao, you can see that um, under conditions where um, the skin blood flow is halted with uh, iontophoresis of uh, high concentrations of norepinephrine, um, that you know, both the skin and the muscle are at that um, efferent arm. Conversely, if you have a whole body heating protocol as illustrated um, by the figure um, from John Johnson's uh, paper, that there is a profound uh, reduction um, in skin blood flow during heat stress conditions um, with that application of lower body negative pressure. And in fact, um, the, these data from Dean Kellogg back in the 1990s suggest that that sympathetic active vasodilator system is also under better reflex control, such that during times of lower body negative pressure, uh, when skin blood flow is elevated and that active vasodilator system is active, that the um, reduction in skin blood flow has of a release of that active vasodilator system. But today um, we're here to really talk about how the cutaneous circulation and how um, looking at really pharmacodissecting 
various uh, signaling mechanisms in the cutaneous circulation can be useful in terms of examining various mechanisms that may be dysregulated in various cohorts with altered uh, blood pressure regulation. So I like this quote, um, uh, so that micro, if we look at microvessel dysfunction, it's really a systemic disease process. And this is what makes the, the skin very useful um, for examining mechanisms of microvessel dysfunction in humans. Because it is, it, it is a systemic disease process, um, this happens uh, in a similar fashion in multiple tissue beds, including the skin. And so therefore, it can be very useful um, as a looking at various minimally invasive or non-invasive models for early identification of uh, humans at risk for peripheral vascular dysfunction and uh, coronary artery disease. And then we can also look at the effect of a given treatment. So over the years, there have um, been various methods that have been utilized in order to deliver uh, various pharmacological agents to the cutaneous circulation um, to get at examining some of these underlying mechanisms. Um, and I think you can readily appreciate uh, from this, these pictures that um, the methods are, have different levels of invasiveness. So over panel A, um, this is an example of intradermal microdialysis, which I'm going to talk about in um, a lot of detail today. Um, panel B, this is an example of microinjections into, uh, the, in this case, into the finger. Um, and then panel C, we have uh, iontophilesis, which is utilizing and taking advantage of um, different currents and charge to really drive in charged molecules into um, the cutaneous circulation. Now, all of these methods have different advantages and disadvantages. And one that I wanna point out from um, this figure is that there's different uh, neural control depending on the area of skin that you're in. So for example, in the fingers or in um, skin that's not hairy or uh, acral skin, we have a high level of adrenergic control and we don't see that that active vasodilator system um, is at play. Whereas in the forearm circulation where we see the intradermal microdialysis probes, we have the combination of both the active vasodilator system as well as the adrenergic vasoconstrictor system. Um, so over the years uh, with various um, skin specific methodologies that have been uh, utilized and investigated, um, we can examine the different vasodilator effects and um, the, a really whole body of work has gone into elucidating the mechanisms that are responsible or mediating these um, alterations in blood flow responses that we observe. Um, and I think uh, the technology has really come a long ways as well as the ability to um, perfuse very uh, low concentrations of um, uh, in, uh, chemical agents, um, uh, pharmacological agents um, into the skin to be able to get at these specific mechanisms. So today um, I'm really going to talk about specifically uh, the um, direct drug delivery through intradermal microdialysis, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about utilizing local heating as a method uh, for examining uh, ENOS specific um, uh, endothelial function and dysfunction. So this table, and this is uh, by no means um, a complete table, this is just a, a few examples of um, some of the different diseases and conditions that have been um, examined uh, utilizing intradermal microdialysis. So looking at different methods from the local heating responses to um, looking at reactive hyperemia um, and then also direct delivery of uh, the um, endothelium dependent agonist acetylcholine and the endothelium independent uh, uh, NO contributor um, sodium nitroprusside through either microdialysis um, or through the application with um, uh, iontophoresis. And what you can see is that we observe impaired endothelium dependent dilation in a, a variety of these disease conditions and that they are um, mediated by various different mechanisms. Um, and then we can also observe that these uh, mechanisms are altered with various interventions 
whether that be antihypertensive therapies or statin therapies. Um, and I'd like to point you to a very nice resource. This is a chapter that just came out in Comprehensive Physiology in 2021, um, which is uh, beautifully written and, and uh, comprehensive as the name um, would uh, entail. So um, today I'm going to be talking about intradermal microdialysis as this method for um, administering microconcentrations of pharmacologic agents directly to the cutaneous vasculature. And we have a cartoon of the intradermal microdialysis. Um, and what you can see is that this catheter is placed into the intradermal layers of the skin. Um, this is accomplished through utilizing an introducer. So small gauge needle that goes along through those intradermal layers. The catheter is then thread through the needle and the needle is removed, leaving that catheter in place. Um, the catheters come in various molecular weight cutoffs. So this is something to keep in mind depending on the size of the molecule that you want to perfuse into that area of skin. Typically, um, the drug perfuses out into an area of skin about the size of a dime or so, the area of a dime, a uh, uh, US currency dime. And various um, molecules can be perfused through that uh, microdialysis catheter, um, diffused through passive diffusion out into the, um, and affect both the neural and vascular signaling mechanisms. Conversely, um, other molecules that are released um, in that area can then diffuse back into the catheter and then uh, various substances can be recovered um, out from the end of this um, microdialysis probe. We typically pair this um, with both uh, an element to control local temperature, um, whether you're going to be utilizing that element to induce um, heating of the skin or to clamp temperature to look at reflex mechanisms uh, mediating vasodilation and vasoconstriction. And um, through that local heater or local cooler, um, there is a laser Doppler flowmeter that's also placed um, over the, right over the top of that um, uh, microdialysis catheter. This is what it looks like in practice. Um, you can see here that the probes are placed um, on the ventral side of the forearm. Uh, the reason that we do this is that the ventral side of the forearm typically has experienced less um, UV exposure and also um, has uh, potentially less sun damage or overall sun damage when you're trying to ask questions related to aging. So we utilize that side of the forearm. You can see in the back, there's also our microperfusion pumps that are holding the syringes that are perfusing um, those four intradermal microdialysis uh, fibers that are placed um, in that person's or that participant's um, forearm skin. One question that typically comes up is that, you know, we observe these uh, various changes in the forearm, but does that also happen um, in different regions um, of the skin? So we've performed studies uh, looking at some of these regional differences, um, both in nitric oxide dependent vasodilation as well as sweating mechanisms. And what I can say is that typically um, there's uh, not a lot of regional variation. Um, there tends, to, we do see some, uh, a small amount of variation, um, but uh, the, there is, um, uh, it, it, the magnitude of the responses is typically very similar with just uh, small changes in other NO dependent um, mechanisms. So when um, I teach people and people in the lab come in to utilize and learn this technique, um, one point that I want to get across is that it takes a lot of practice um, to be able to properly uh, do this technique in the laboratory. And people come in and they typically say, I've experienced doing venipuncture and IV placement, um, and this shouldn't be uh, too difficult. And they typically start off, um, you know, utilizing it and placing uh, and needles into the skin. And I say that this um, angle of this needle is completely wrong. So this is what you would typically utilize for um, a vena puncture. And here at this 45 degree angle would um, go too deep and wouldn't be in the intradermal layers um, where we want to place this microdialysis probe. Instead, um, the needle should be placed at about a 15 degree angle. You can see here that we've also marked our entry and exit points about 
uh, two centimeters um, apart so that that nice 10 centimeter long probe can be completely under and in the intradermal layer of the skin. So we end up clean the skin uh, utilizing as a sterile technique. Um, we then um, anesthetize the skin temporarily with a little bit of ice. So ice for typically about five minute, a five minute period of time um, before placing needles into as introducers into the skin. Um, we then place that needle uh, through that about two centimeter uh, uh, area. Um, and the depth is important. So getting into those layers, you know that you're in the right layers when the participant can feel um, the, the needle placement. Um, if you're too deep in the subcutaneous um, fat layers, uh, the participant can't feel. And honestly, the, the, with the needle transition, almost feels like you're going through butter. Um, the participant can then, um, what I also say is that what you want to see is the grayness of the needle, needle and the sheen of the needle, but you don't want to see, um, if, you're, if you're too superficial, you're going to start to see uh, um, the more of the needle and more of the, uh, the sheen of that needle um, in, in that layer of skin. We then um, place the uh, microdialysis probe through the lumen of the needle. Um, and then test the probe utilizing an inert solution. So a ringer solution or a saline solution. And what you look for is to see um, small bubbles of fluid um, perfusing or coming up out of that membrane that you can see here portrayed as that white portion. And then you'll also see a bubble of fluid um, come out the end of that microdialysis uh, probe. You then pull that needle out of the skin, leaving that uh, microdialysis probe right in place under, under the, the surface of the skin. And here, finally, you can see that the local feeding element and that um, uh, laser doctor flometer probe is right over the top of the microdialysis fiber. And again, we place up to four to six microdialysis probes at a time so that a site can serve as a positive control, we have our negative control, and then any sort of interventions or localized interventions that we're um, so from looking at uh, what types of responses that we see um, from a, a, a method to assess a physiological method to assess NO dependent dilation, um, we oftentimes use a local heating protocol where local temperature is um, increased by a standard protocol. And you see an ensuing uh, very nice um, plateau that is reached that is indeed NO dependent, because then we perfuse um, uh, the NO synthase inhibitor over the top of that. And you can um, readily uh, see that um, to drop in skin blood flow that is uh, nitric oxide mediated. In a study that um, was recently published by Tony Wolf um, here at Penn State, um, in this particular study, uh, he looked at uh, four weeks of vitamin D in um, white and black uh, participants and pre-vitamin D supplementation uh, in impaired NO-dependent dilation and post-vitamin D supplementation uh, uh, saw a restoration of, um, of nitric oxide dependent vasodilation. We also utilize um, a, system, or, uh, a dose response protocol to examine epithelial function via pharmacological methods. So you can uh, see laser Doppler flux along the y-axis and time along your x-axis. And this is a typical uh, dose response protocol. And what I would point out here is that the timing of this dose response protocol typically takes about 90 minutes. And this is after the resolution of the hyperemic response period um, from simply placing needles into the skin. Um, what we observe is that uh, we want to take our, our, our values after when we, get, we reach a nice steady plateau. So each one of these bumps here uh, corresponds to about 15 minutes uh, a period of time as we're perfusing um, uh, acetylcholine through that microdialysis probe. And at the end, we perfuse sodium nitroprusside um, to obtain a maximal vasodilation for normalization purposes for the data. And I think that this is really important 
um, for a couple of different reasons. One is that um, you know, with so many different microdialysis probes, we need a way to normalize the data to account for the different capillaries or the number of open capillaries under that um, uh, laser Doppler flowmeter. Additionally, um, the way that the data are analyzed are going to be dependent on the questions that are being asked. So for example, um, we have uh, uh, along the bottom, the figures, um, a, the acetylcholine dose response, and we have uh, a straight point to point um, connection of, of the data versus uh, a curve modeling of the data. And again, this all depends on um, the questions that are being asked if you want to look at um, traditional pharmacokinetics and dynamics and look at cooperativity. Um, uh, so in that case, we would uh, utilize more curve modeling of the data. Um, uh, correspondingly, um, these are data from uh, Megan Winter in the Stackenfeld's laboratory, and I would point you to this paper um, published in JAP in 2011, which showed that different uh, normalization um, can affect interpretation of the data. So whether you look at from a constrictor function, whether you look at normalization from changing baseline versus whether you look at, um, you model the data um, utilizing different curve parameters can affect that um, interpretation of the data. Um, so uh, in practice, uh, these are data from Jody Graney, who looked at endothelium dependent dilation in uh, non-traditional cardiovascular disease risk factor of major depressive disorder. And what you can observe is that um, you can see the control sites in uh, open circles where a site that is uh, perfused continuously with the synthase inhibitor L name, we can look at the area between the curves to observe really the functional NO dependent dilation. We can also, um, like I uh, mentioned previously, um, curve model the data to look at the EC50s. In this case, you can see that the EC50 um, of the acetylcholine dose response is uh, different, is statistically different in those with um, major depressive disorder, suggesting um, uh, these significant impairments in NO dependent dilation with this non-traditional cardiovascular disease risk factor. These are uh, constrictor function data. And this time uh, we perfuse the um, constrictor angiotensin II in a dose-dependent fashion, um, looking at uh, vasoconstrictor function in those um, who have experienced a preeclamptic pregnancy. So these are women um, who within one year after giving birth um, from uh, experiencing or from having preeclampsia. And I think you can readily see that those with, um, who have had a preeclamptic pregnancy have an increase in their vasoconstrictor response to angiotensin II. We pair this oftentimes with uh, a sampling of skin. So we um, utilize a skin biopsy approach to um, get a very small skin bit um, and then can perform traditional biochemical analyses to look at receptor expression. And in this case, you can see that those who have experienced a preeclamptic pregnancy have an increase in the um, AT1 receptor expression. So um, how do we do this? What are some of the pros and cons? So we use a typical punch biopsy for obtaining these small samples um, of skin. So this is a three millimeter punch biopsy. Um, we want to get deep enough into that layer of skin where you get very nice vessels. So this is right into that intradermal layers that go um, just above that subcutaneous fat layer. Um, we uh, anesthetize the skin in this case with a little bit of lidocaine without norepinephrine. And the lidocaine injections need to occur in uh, the surrounding areas and not right under where the biopsy is going to be taken. Um, the reason for this is that oftentimes if you infiltrate that biopsy uh, tissue with um, lidocaine, it can uh, affect some of the quality of the tissue that you're going to obtain. Then we perform traditional homogenization um, of the tissue and uh, various uh, Western blots or other activity assays that we would be interested in. Um, people oftentimes ask, uh, okay, if you take this biopsy sample, what does the um, scar look like? What are participants going to be concerned about? Um, so here you see a, a biopsy sample that um, is uh, 
a couple of years after healing. Um, this is two, uh, about a year in a more lightly pigmented person. And then here is um, about a year in a participant who experienced some keloid scarring. So the final thing I'd like to talk about is that um, you can utilize uh, intradermal microdialysis and obtain, um, use various sampling of diacetate, um, a dialysate, excuse me, um, to look at the recovery of various substances, either being uh, released into those layers and or from topical application of various analgesics. So in this study, we um, uh, used um, uh, menthol and we looked at the vasodilator response that ensues with menthol at different concentrations. And then um, we sampled to look at the um, pharmacokinetics and dynamics of menthol that was actually getting into the skin. And um, you can see that using uh, traditional HPLC, high-sensitivity um, high HPLC, we were able to um, look at corresponding vasodilation as well as uh, menthol recovery. So with that, um, I will wrap up and, and uh, my key points, um, I guess more so just say proper technique training and practice, practice, practice are essential with wigs and approaches. Um, so thank you to all the people that made this studies possible and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, unfortunately, I have, we have time for one question, um, and I, I had a bunch. So, if uh, there, there will be time for questions at the end, so we can we can uh, address those. But one question that came in uh, was um, I thought particularly interesting, and and it was, uh, can you <clears throat> use microdialysis, uh, intradermal microdialysis, to detect inflammatory markers? And uh, there was a question with that was, can you use this in skeletal muscle to detect noradrenaline? And, and the question, they're, they're slightly different, but uh, I think the question about skeletal muscle and uh, the, uh, relating to what you can do in the skin might be an, an interesting thing to address as well. Yeah, yeah. so um, you can utilize microdialysis in muscle. Um, this approach has been uh, used to recover different substances. Um, including histamine, um, other inflammatory markers. The thing that you have to keep in mind is the molecular weight cutoff of, um, of your probe. So whether uh, a substance is going to be produced in a high enough concentration and is going to um, be recoverable out of that probe, there's certainly different ways to optimize that. So um, whether you utilize push-pull techniques, you put, utilize uh, greater concentrations of say something like albumin, that can very that pull substances in through the microdialysis probe. Um, and you can do this in both skin and in muscle. In muscle, you do utilize more, um, you anesthetize the skin with lidocaine because uh, it's, it's much more painful as you're going, you use more of a, a hook-shaped needle to get it into the muscle. Um, but it's, in terms of recovery, um, again, there are various techniques to aid in recovery. And um, from muscle, you can also, um, utilize different approaches to, to look at um, various indices of blood flow that are going to be different from skin, where you can utilize more direct indices of blood flow, such as laser baphlogometry or laser speckle imagery. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so next, moving on, it is my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Von Meesfield um, to, from the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. He's going to be giving a talk entitled Interneural Recordings from Postganglionic Synthetic Axons in Awake Humans, Single Unit Recordings, and Increasing the Utility of Multi-Unit Recordings. Dr. Meesfield, you're muted. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. All right, thanks, Lacey. And thank you, Nina, for the invitation. And I'd just like to acknowledge how important it is that uh, we recognize women scientists here. And it's great to be, I feel very proud to be, have been, to have been invited to speak amongst these excellent women scientists here. 
Uh, it's also nice to see so many friends who have uh, who, uh, who have logged in today. So uh, yes, yeah, so here's uh, what I'll be talking about. I know that many of you are familiar with the approaches that I'll be talking about, but many of you will not be. So uh, the technique that I'll be talking about is uh, known as microneurography, developed in Sweden in the mid-60s. And it allows one to tap into peripheral nerves in awake human subjects. And as you can see, it's, it's contributed a lot of information on tactile and proprioceptive sensation, pain, sensory motor control, and of relevance to the current session, control of the sympathetic nervous system. I guess it allows us to tap into that activity directly. So tungsten microelectrodes, which is what we use, they're insulated right down the very tip, can be inserted into any accessible peripheral nerve, median or ulnar or, or radial nerves of the wrist or upper arm, perineal or tibial nerves of the knee, and that's most commonly uh, what people would use for sympathetic nerve recordings, or even the sural or posterior tibial nerve of the ankle. And there have also been a few recordings uh, uh, in which microelectrodes have been inserted into cranial nerves, such as the inferior alveola in the now. Excuse me, Vaughn. I don't mean to interrupt, but we'd like for you to share your screen. Oh my goodness, all this. So <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> nice one. Okay, look, I, uh, yeah. Go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry. Share screen. I thought I was doing that, right. Okay. Okay, look, so you can see this all now, yes? Yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry. As I as I was saying, uh, we can also uh, make recordings from cranial nerves, such as the inferior alveola or suboptal branches of the trigeminal nerve. Recently, the vagus nerve. Why we'll are we talking about that? Um, I use the NeuroAmp X by AD Instruments. There are other amplifiers uh, available. Uh, I should say that I was the design consultant for this and it's a very low noise, high gain amplifier and as you can see here, it's suitable for human connection. Got a high signal to noise ratio. Um, this is the head stage, the pre-amplifier. Because we're using um, high impedance tungsten microelectrodes, they do tend to pick up a, a lot of electrical noise, so it's important to pre-amplify the signal close to the recording side. So the head stage here pre-amplifies the signal 100 times. Uh, this is stainless steel, and the uh, benefit of this is that it allows us also to record sympathetic nerve activity and other peripheral nerve activity while scanning the brain. Uh, I won't talk about that today. This is how it looks. We have the head stage. This is a participant's knee. Uh, we have an active microelectrode inserted into the common perineal nerve, also known as the fibular nerve. We've just marked the course of this nerve uh, with a marker here on the skin. Um, we give weak electrical pulses through a surface probe. And if we're over the nerve, we get muscle twitches of the foot. We get radiating uh, pins and needles, if we're activating cutaneous axons, we have a reference microelectrode and a ground electrode. So this is a differential amplifier and we're looking at the, the voltage difference between the active electrode, the uh, high impedance microelectrode and the indifferent or low impedance reference electrode, which is just under the skin. So uh, here's a cross section of a peripheral nerve composed of distinct fascicles. If we're recording from a muscle fascicle of the nerve, uh, we can impale uh, individual myelinated axons. Uh, this is a, a, a recording of a spontaneous selected muscle spindle afferent, a, a stretch receptor in the muscle, and here we can see it responding to muscle stretch. Uh, we can also record from typically groups of unmyelinated axons, so C fibers, uh, or even individual uh, C fibers. In this case, we're recording from a single muscle basic constricted neuron, and I'll come back to this. It's important to note 
that myelinated axons generated positive going spikes, unmyelinated axons generate negative going spikes with this monopolar electrode arrangement we use. This fact allows us to differentiate the activity uh, of myelinated axons from unmyelinated axons. So here we have a spontaneously active muscle spindle just firing very regularly. We can extract those spikes and we can see the, the regular firing rate in the top trace. But in this uh, two for the price of one recording, as it were, we can also detect these bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which are occurring spontaneously and which have this clear cardiac rhythmicity. And what we've done here is shifted the nerve signal back in time to align these sympathetic bursts with the peak of the relevant R wave to which they are temporally coupled. There is a, a delay because of the, um, the slow conducting uh, C fibers that uh, carry sympathetic outflow to the periphery. So first I'll talk about uh, how to optimize multi-unit recordings of sympathetic nerve activity. Now, uh, because these sympathetic axons are unmyelinated, they tend to travel within fascicles of the nerve as a group. And uh, so most recordings are multi-unit. And it's worth pointing out that the diameter of these C fibers in humans are about a micron, whereas the myelinated axons, such as the muscle spindle that I referred to, are about 10 to 12 microns in humans. So an order of magnitude difference in, in axonal diameter. And most laboratories are just interested in the mean voltage nerve signal. Uh, or the RMS root mean squared process nerve signal. And from that, you just simply count the number of bursts per minute, that's burst frequency, or burst incidence, burst per 100 heartbeats, the latter being used to take into account differences in resting heart rate uh, across individuals. Uh, some laboratories also measure total burst activity. And this is a cumulative sum of all burst amplitudes normalized to the largest burst in, in recording. It's important to recognize that absolute amplitude is largely meaningless in terms of microvolts because that deter is determined by the proximity of the microelectrode tip to the active axons. So if you're close, you get a large signal. If you're far away, you'll get a small signal. And, uh, but also as I'll, elaborate on, it's, it's important to recognize that there is more in the nerve signal that can be extracted, particularly when the mean voltage signal is small. And some laboratories, they'll own, that of course they record the, the raw nerve activity, but they won't necessarily store it because you need to sample at high frequencies, at least 10 kilohertz. It uses up a lot of uh, computer memory and uh, it's easier just to store, uh, particularly long recordings, the, uh, the integrated nerve signal or the RMS process nerve signal, because you can sample that at much lower frequencies. But then, of course, you lose all that you have to extract from a raw nerve signal. So here is an example on the left of a, a typical multi-unit recording that we would attain from our lab. So we've got spontaneous bursts of negative going spikes. Here's the ECG. Um, this is the root mean square process nerve signal, and this is the integrated nerve signal. They look similar, different processes to, to obtain these. This is a, a, essentially a leaky integrator with a time constant of 100 milliseconds. The root mean square signal, however, is a moving average here um, taken over 200 milliseconds. So we get a much smoother profile and we don't have a, a, a time lag introduced, which really is of, of no consequence. However, on the right, we can see that if we look at the raw nerve activity, we can clearly see sympathetic spikes there and we can hear them on the loudspeaker. But because there are so few spikes contributing to the signal, you see very little in the mean voltage neurogram as shown in the top trace. So do you look at this recording and say, this is rubbish? 
Or do you look at this record and say, wow, this is great because look at these spikes I can record. Well, many would say, no, we can't use this. That's a waste, in my opinion. So this is a, a, a typical oligo unitary recording, oligo meaning few. So we've got a few sympathetic axons firing spontaneously. We've got some large spikes, we've got some small spikes here. Uh, and clearly, when we've got a few, few neurons active, few axons active, we get a nice population response for the, the, the RMS nerve shown here. This simply shows, the asterisk shows that there's a, an ectopic beat, and then we get a prolonged cardiac interval here, and a compensatory increase in muscle synthetic nerve activity. And this fall in blood pressure is shown here. Um, it is important to recognize artifacts in a nerve recording, and unless you have the raw nerve signal uh, on hand, you may not be able to recognize it. This is blown up here. This individual electrical artifact, very brief spike, generates in the RMS, beg your pardon, a, uh, a, a characteristic square wave profile, which is clearly different from the, uh, the, the, the smooth uh, ramp, uh, up and down ramp that we see with a sympathetic burst. Um, we can use, uh, so look, I, I use uh, um, AD Instruments uh, software, lab chart. Um, there are others, other uh, approaches people have used. But within the feature called cyclic measurements, which looks for regularly occurring peaks, you can use this to detect from the RMS nerve or the integrated nerve. Uh, bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity on the left, and they're shown, the detected bursts are shown here, and also from skin sympathetic nerve activity on the right. A skin sympathetic nerve activity, uh, which is relevant to what Lacey was talking about, that the bursts are much broader than the bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity shown on the left. And this shows uh, what I mean with the cyclic uh, measurements, there are various presets. So if you're using, if you want to look at heart rate and you're obviously using the ECG, there's a preset for ECG, for rat, for dog, for humans. Uh, for, the, for the sympathetic nerve recordings, there isn't a preset for that, but here's a nice little tip. Uh, use respiratory airflow because respiratory airflow is characterized by slow ramping up and down uh, profiles. And it actually works very, very well at detecting bursts of uh, sympathetic airflow, both to muscle and skin, in the uh, multi-unit RMS or integrated nerve signal. And we can adjust the threshold here. This is currently set at one and a half standard deviations. Uh, we can adjust that threshold so we're just detecting these big bursts and not the noise in the background. And this is shown here. So here's a, a, a screenshot of a recording from our lab. Spontaneous uh, bursts, negative going spikes. And um, this feature, the cyclic measurements, has detected these bursts. And then we can set up another channel uh, shown in green where instead of uh, just presenting uh, event markers for each burst, we can get a cumulative count. We can do the same for R waves, we can count the R waves, we can count the peak of inspiration, et cetera. So it's a very, very uh, useful feature. We also use another feature called peak parameters, which allows us to uh, um, select an individual burst, measure the rise time, the width, the, the peak amplitude, baseline, area, etc. We also use this approach to get the individual burst amplitudes uh, with every R wave. So we just simply write a macro, so we've now shifted the nerve signal back in time to align each burst with the peak of the R wave. And then we simply jump from R wave to R wave 
and uh, measure, measure the burst amplitudes. So we get you know, low amplitudes for zero bursts and high amplitudes for actual bursts. And then it's just a matter of go exporting the data into Excel and uh, saying, okay, anything above 0.2 uh, microvolts, we call a burst or something. Um, it, the, and the spike histogram feature of, uh, of LabChart and of course other um, data acquisition and analysis processes have, have similar features. Um, it's simply a window discriminator which allows one to extract these negative going spikes from the nerve signal. So here's the RMS nerve signal, here are the uh, negative going spikes and the spike histogram software has plotted in this row down here called spikes, all these bursts that we've, uh, we've set the threshold to detect. We've also used the same software to detect the R waves of the ECG and all the, also the inspiratory peaks of the respiratory signal. So now we have these timing events of the, in this case, muscle sympathetic nerve activity, the uh, R waves of the ECG, the inspiratory peaks, of the, respiration, and we can generate autocorrelation and cross-correlation histograms, also a feature within spike histogram. If we look at the left, on the bottom is the autocorrelation histogram of respiration. So time zero is the first inspiratory peak, here's the next inspiratory peak, the one after, and then back in time over here. And this is the cross-correlation on the top, which basically showing the timing of each sympathetic spike with respect to peak of inspiration. So you can clearly see that there is respiratory modulation. We know that, but this allows us to quantify it. On the right, we see the very well-known cardiac modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, the autocorrelation, the ECG shown on the bottom. This is muscle sympathetic nerve activity. We can use the same approach for skin sympathetic nerve activity. And although most people say there is no relationship between skin sympathetic nerve activity and blood pressure parameters, it still has cardiac rhythmicity. And this allows us to detect it. It also has, uh, we, we know that it is modulated by respiration as well. And if we compare muscle and skin sympathetic nerve activity, well, really the standout feature is that the cardiac modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity is much greater through the strong coupling with the arterial barrier reflux. The cardiac modulation of skin sympathetic nerve activity is of a similar magnitude to the respiratory modulation of skin sympathetic nerve activity and the respiratory modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. So again, we can quantify these. We can look at respiratory sympathetic coupling in, uh, in health and disease, which I won't talk about, but we can also use it to look at uh, this approach to look at other cyclic inputs. In this case, we're applying galvanic vestibular stimulation behind the ears, which induces sensations of swaying side to side, can induce nausea. It's a way of activating the vestibular system and we can clearly see that we've got cyclic modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, frequency dependent. So again, we can quantify that. The reason I'm showing you this is, this analysis is based on the uh, extracted sympathetic spikes, not from the RMS process signal. Importantly, by extracting the sympathetic spikes, we can, using spike histogram, we can separate out uh, the sympathetic activity from myelinated ac axons, like the muscle spindle I showed you, or importantly, EMG. So here, the participant has just tensed the, tensed the leg. That causes a shift in the baseline of the mean voltage signal, which means it can be hard to detect these bursts of synthetic activity, um, but we all know that neural spikes have a very brief duration, half a millisecond, say, shown in this cluster here. EMG spikes are much broader, and we can separate those. 
Then, having extracted these negative going spikes, uh, we can generate the spikes down here, and we can reconstruct the mean voltage neurogram from these extracted spikes. Importantly, this approach allows us to uh, record sympathetic nerve activity to contracting muscle, which people have had difficulties with before because of the EMG infiltration of the nerve signal. But by extracting the sympathetic spikes, we can measure sympathetic outflow to contracting muscle. And we can, sh and, and basically at the approach shown here, we do R wave triggered histograms. We, get, we uh, quantify the number of spikes within the burst of EMG of um, sympathetic nerve activity. So we, we count the spikes. Uh, and we can look at how that changes in, in a given maneuver. But uh, importantly, we can record in terms of spikes per minute, the uh, increases in muscle sympathetic nerve activity to a contracting muscle, even up to 50% of maximal voluntary contraction. And here's the blood pressure increase during isometric contractions. And we can clearly see that there is an increase in sympathetic outflow to the contracting muscle. Uh, we've also used the cyclic, uh, the, the cyclic uh, spike histogram feature to look at rhythmic exercise. Here we're just doing slow isotonic dorsiflexions of the, of the uh, ankle. We're recording these bursts of sympathetic nerve activity, extracting the sympathetic spikes, performing cross-correlation hist histograms. This, this is the muscle sympathetic nerve activity versus the EMG. And this is the cross-correlation of the EMG versus movement. Clearly, we've got entrainment of sympathetic outflow to the EMG, which is obviously entrained to the voluntary movement. Um, it's mo this, this modulation of sympathetic outflow is much higher to the ipsilateral muscle, that is the contracting muscle, than it is to the non-contracting, to the contralateral muscle. And we can quantify that as shown here. So the EMG modulation is the same on both sides, of course, but the modulation index, how uh, sympathetic outflow is modulated during the voluntary contraction is much greater to the uh, ipsilateral muscle, contracting muscle. So just to summarize this first part, although overall burst properties continue to provide useful information, there's actually much more uh, than these somewhat gross metrics, burst frequency, burst uh, incidence, for instance. Extracting the negative going spikes allows us to uh, get rid of artifacts and uh, perform cross-correlation analysis. And, uh, and then that leads us to uh, pinnacle, as it were, of extracting sympathetic activity from the raw nerve signal, and that is recording from individual sympathetic neurons. Now, the approach is exactly the same, but we use much higher impedance microelectrodes. And what you really want to get is a recording in which the spikes stand out from the background noise. Here we have uh, two spikes labeled one, and down here we've got the same two spikes labeled one, and these smaller spikes labeled two. Now with any single unit recording, whether it be in humans or experimental animals, the principle of spike superimposition is used to uh, confirm beyond reasonable doubt that you are recording from one and only one axon. Here we have individual uh, spike morphologies from this labeled neuron here. And if we superimpose them in E, we can see the uniform spike morphology. Conversely, in D, we've got these smaller spikes and they have varying uh, shapes and sizes. So this is not a single unit recording. This, on the other hand, is a single unit recording. And on the right, I've shown a, a, a figure from Michael Gilby um, in London, who records from uh, individual sympathetic axons supplying the rat tail artery. So it's clear to see that the spike morphologies 
are similar to what we record in humans. Triphasic profile with a negative, uh, a dominant negative uh, peak. Um, we can look at, this is a now human recording, we can look at uh, uh, physiological increases in sympathetic outflow. This is during a maximum respiratory breath hold, which causes a sustained increase in sympathetic outflow, shown in the RMS process signal. Importantly, individual neurons, shown superimposed here, they just putter away, firing mostly once per, per burst. This is a common feature. And in fact, we see it for muscle vase constricted neurons, cutaneous vase constricted neurons, and pseudomotor neurons. What this shows here is the number of times that a, a, a given neuron does not fire, so zero spikes, fires once, twice, three times, or four times within a cardiac interval. And you can see that the muscle vase constricted neurons, they're mostly silent, about 70% of the time at rest, they're silent. Firing probability when they are firing, about 31%. Similar patterns that we see are seen with cutaneous vase constricted neurons. These are these were recorded during uh, exposure to cold, just before they were shivering. I returned to Sweden to, to get these recordings. We couldn't get subjects cold enough in in, uh, in Sydney, probably be easier in Melbourne. And in pseudomotor neurons, we we heated the participants. Again, similar patterns. And in the bottom trace, if we simply look at those cardiac involves in which the neurons were firing, we can see, regardless of their identity as muscle vase constrictor, cutaneous vase constrictor, or pseudomotion neurons, they're mostly just firing once per burst. They occasionally fire twice, three times, four times. Here is a patient with heart failure, and we've got these ectopic beats with prolonged cardiac intervals. As I mentioned earlier, that induces a compensatory larger and broader burst of synthetic nerve activity. In this case, this neuron, despite being recorded from a patient with heart failure, with very high sympathetic outflow, uh, is just puttering away one spike per burst. Here, during the ectopic beats, is firing twice. Again, I won't go through all this, but... Two minutes. Sorry? You have about two minutes. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, I won't go through this, but uh, if we, we, can, we can look at different disease states and we can see how uh, they, the, the firing patterns can change in different disease states, but on the whole, individual neurons fire once and only once. So to summarize this part, as I just said, they primarily fire only once per burst irrespective of their identity. And this is also seen in physiological and pathophysiological increases. And the firing rates increase from about 0.4 hertz to one hertz. So again, very, very low firing rates in, in human postganglionic sympathetic axons. And this indicates that increases in firing probability and the recruitment of silent neurons and not rate coding is the primary means by which increases in synthetic driver brought about. Now, there's another approach. Uh, Kevin Shoemaker and colleagues uh, popularized this wavelet decomposition of multi-unit synthetic recordings. You can extract individual units and look at their uh, recruitment properties. Um, this is great, but it can't determine their firing rates. And that, for that, you need single unit recordings. And recent studies by uh, Philip Miller and colleagues I've shown that not all vase uh, constricted neurons, muscle vase constricted neurons, receive excitatory drive. Some are inhibited during certain maneuvers, and this is an exciting new area. Final conclusions. I won't go through this in, in detail, just to uh, show them here. This is more to the nerve signal. We can extract individual spikes. Uh, we can uh, get rid of interference from uh, myelinated axons or EMG, we can perform cross-correlation analysis, and of course, we can uh, record from single axons. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, look, just feel free to contact me. Um,
there is a recent review I wrote, it's freely available from clinical autonomic research, and this covers a lot of the things I was just speaking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have several questions in the chat, and I think we have time for probably one. Um, and I'm going to, if this is from, uh, says, can you discuss the significance of multi-unit versus single-unit recordings and pathophysiology, such as studying the study of MSNA in mean and obese hypertensives? Yeah, look, that's a, a good question. And uh, my colleague, Elizabeth Lambert, uh, who's at the Baker Institute, has done a lot of work on that, uh, shown that individual so by recording from single units you actually get more information and shown that uh, there is an increase in single unit uh, multiple firing in individuals with obese hypertension so there are differences between obesity per se and those with those are obese individuals with, with hypertension so you can uh, yeah the single unit recordings do give a, a, a finer level of information that multi recordings provide. Having said that, I'm not disputing the, the, the utility of multi unit recordings. We need, we need both sorts of information. Um, but importantly, it can differentiate between pathophysiology and normal physiology. Some people have higher levels of nosocomial nerve activity at rest, similar to people with heart failure, but their single unit firing properties are not changed. So that tells you that they're normal. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, there are more questions in the chat, uh, but we'll save those until the end. Um, there's also uh, Patrick Mueller um, has uh, there's a, a session on Wednesday um, specifically about pathophysiology um, and, and looking at analysis of uh, synthetic nerve activity. So um, look at that uh, in the EB schedule. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Nina. Um, our, thank you very much, and thank you for a wonderful talk, Vaughn. Um, uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, I, I always learn an enormous amount when I hear your talks. Excellent. Thank you, and thank you all so much for um, um, all of your wonderful presentations. Uh, so we now have some time just uh, for a few questions to the various presenters today. Uh, and I'm going to start off um, from one to Dr. Macefield. Um, and this is from Justin Sprick, and he asks, is there any utility in applying single unit nerve recordings in the study of nerve vascular transduction, i.e. the change in mean arterial pressure or blood flow in response to a given burst in, of MSNA? Uh, thanks, Lacey. Um, yeah, look, uh, it was a good question, and I responded directly to Justin, but basically, I, I don't think it would be particularly useful given that the vasoconstriction is brought about by the activity of many, many sympathetic axons. Um, look, it'd be interesting to look at that with, you know, in, in the skin with microvasculature, um, but uh, with large systemic vessels, I, I, yeah, I don't think you, there'd be much advantage to um, trying to correlate vascular transduction to the firing of single axons not saying that it can't be done I mean, perhaps it should be done but yeah it, my first thought would be wouldn't be particularly useful but good question well, nina you mentioned you had some uh, questions for lindsay uh no i got to my those were my questions and i got okay. to that's uh, <laughs> well, with that, there's been a lot in the chat box and uh, answering directly back and forth to one another. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, and today we have a, a sponsor for the session um, through AD Instruments. And uh, Dr. Philip Griffiths is going to tell us a little bit about benefits of the solid state sensors for data quality. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, AD Instruments for their sponsorship and um, now look forward to hearing what Dr. Griffiths has to say. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to everybody else who's presented today. Uh, some really interesting talks. Um, 
And a particular thank you to uh, Vaughan Maysfield for his uh, continuing support to uh, ADI for in the field of microneurography. Uh, so I'm going to present today um, just some uh, slides about the AD Instruments new uh, telemetry system, uh, which uh, uh, and and its its application in blood pressure research. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, I'll um, I'll run through a very very brief introduction of the telemetry system. Uh, specifically a rat telemetry system. Uh, I'll then talk about um, telemetry uh, with the gold standard pressure sensor technology from, from Miller. Uh, and then I'll run through some of our customers' uh, recent publications uh, using the telemetry system uh, and highlight some of the data and, and, and what they've been able to achieve using the telemetry system. So just to give you uh, a quick uh, background introduction, uh, so I'm presenting the Kaha Sciences Telemetry System. Uh, this is not actually new, uh, a new telemetry system. It's been around for, for some 15 years now, I think. Uh, and it was introduced under the, the brand Telemetry Research uh, before it was purchased by Miller in 2014. Kaha came on board in 2017 uh, and took the te te technology over from Miller uh, before AD Instruments purchased Kaha in February 20, 2021, so this year. Um, this is a really positive move, I think, for ADI and the telemetry technology. Um, and I'm really excited about where uh, it's going to move forwards into, into the future. Uh, I first came across the telemetry technology in, in about 2014, I think it was, uh, during my postdoc at the University of Bristol in the UK, where I was using the system to record uh, blood pressure in rats. I moved to work for Kaha in 2019 to, do, to provide sales and support in Europe um, before I moved across to ADI at the start of this year. Uh, so I'm pretty experienced with the system. Um, like I say, I haven't got very much time and I'm not going to dive into too much detail about the system, uh, but there are three take homes that I, uh, I want you to, to remember. Uh, firstly, the telemetry system uses innovative wireless power technology to remove the restriction of battery life from telemeters. So this is really useful for, for long term recording. Uh, um, so for instance, if you want to want to study and track disease state over a long period of time, uh, or also if you're looking at continuous recording um, uh, is possible with this system. So you can record 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that's particularly useful for looking at spontaneous activity um, that's, that's difficult to detect if you're only going to record for short bouts uh, like you can with other uh, telemetry systems. The RAT telemeters, uh, the RAT pressure telemeters incorporate uh, Miller solid state pressure sensors. So these are really the gold standard for, for pressure measurement um, and provide unrivaled accuracy, fidelity uh, for, for pressure measurement. Uh, the system is also very easy to use. It's very simple to plug in and set up to start using. Um, and it's also got really good integration with the existing uh, AD Instruments hardware, so PowerLab, uh, the analog outputs of these blue smart pads go straight into the PowerLab. Um, and obviously LabChart offers a number of um, analysis options for blood pressure, like the blood pressure module um, for easy analysis. Uh, further information can be found on the AD Instruments website, um, including a number of uh, webinars that we put together uh, under the guise of CAHA, uh, particularly this one that I presented last year, uh, not, not blowing my own trumpet too much, but it uh, gives a pretty good introduction to the system if you want to find out more. Okay, so to focus now on the pressure telemeters, um, the system integrates the Miller solid state pressure sensors with uh, innovative telemetry technology to provide unrivaled accuracy, fidelity and reproducibility compared to, to fluid filled catheters. Catheters have um, this two French solid state sensor at the catheter tip, so pressure is measured directly at source. Uh, the, 
the pressure waveform is not transmitted through the fluid to a transducer in the telemeter body. The pressure is actually measured wherever you put this sensor. So that means that there's no signal attenuation. Uh, you get an excellent frequency response. There's no risk of the catheter blocking or kinking or any artifacts due to animal movement. So this essentially, um, and, and I assume quite a lot of you are familiar with the benefits of the Miller technology already, but it, it combines uh, all of these usual benefits with, the, uh, with telemetry for measuring in conscious unrestrained rats. Um, it's ideal for measuring arterial and, uh, and or ventricular blood pressure, but also there's a range of applications which benefit from the accuracy and fidelity of the Miller technology as well. And I will just touch on that uh, a bit later on in the presentation too. So now just to focus on some recent publications from customers um, where they've put the pressure telemeters to excellent use. Uh, and firstly, um, this publication came out in Nature at the start of the year from Dr. Jordan Square and colleagues at the University of Calgary and the Swiss Feder Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, they used the TRM56SP pressure and sympathetic nerve activity telemeter um, to monitor uh, arterial blood pressure and SNA in a rat model of spinal cord injury in combination with stimulation techniques, uh, which they used to stabilize uh, the hemodynamics of the animals after injury. Um, what they were able to achieve with the telemetry system uh, was, was continuous and long-term recording. So they were recording 24 hours a day, seven days a week for about seven, uh, well, it was seven weeks after surgery or post-injury rather, I think eight weeks after the telemeters were implanted. Um, and just to emphasize that the quality of the data that you can get with these pressure telemeters uh, and the stability of the signal is, is really good. Uh, and and that's really emphasized in the fact that they were able to set up and run automated um, and continuous data analysis uh, with, without any real human intervention, uh, at least in the initial phases of the data analysis. Uh, so they were able to set this up and, and start, uh, uh, start the analysis as the animals were recording. And you really wouldn't be able to do this if, if your signal was, was littered with movement artifacts and things. So that's a real benefit of the system. Um, they were also able to use other aspects of the system. They were able to record uh, during their uh, uh, spinal cord injury surgery, uh, and they were also able to monitor hemodynamic parameters in a, a behavioral paradigm uh, where they were recording um, away from the home cage. So this really excellent paper um, and, and quite clinically relevant findings as well. I would highly recommend you go away and, and read it if you if you get a chance. Um, and it really nicely highlights the, the possibilities with the pressure telemetry system from CAHA and AV instruments. So I mentioned um, I would touch on some of the other applications and I'm just going to throw a bit of a curveball in this um, sort of blood pressure and, and um, control of blood pressure session. Um, but I'm going to just present this data from uh, our customers at the Danish Headache Centre in Copenhagen, who are using the TRM54P single pressure telemeters to measure intracranial pressure in rats. Uh, Sajeda Eftakari and colleagues uh, presented some really nice paper in this uh, data in this paper published last year. It really emphasizes the accuracy and reproducibility it's possible to achieve with the car pressure telemeters. Um, and it would be very challenging to recreate this, I think, with fluid filled catheters. Uh, so if you don't know much about ICP, uh, it's a very low pressure. Uh, it's often less than 10 millimeters of mercury. And in this example from the paper, they were actually recording less than five millimeters of mercury. Um, but you can see with the solid state sensor, you get a nice waveform. Uh, uh, with the different components of the waveform uh, mapped across it as well. Um, and they were able to accurately, accurately capture this. And that's uh, reflected in the data collected from 10 animals. So this is the raw traces here. And you do see some, some daily uh, variation, maybe at the beginning uh, in the recovery phase of their, uh, after their surgery. Uh, but then you see a nice uh, and pretty stable 
uh, pressure signal that they've recorded uh, from these animals across uh, 50 days. So they're doing quite long-term recordings as well. And that's shown down here in this graph as well, where they've, it, the gray scale represents the different uh, stages of their experiments. They've got the resting phase here where the animal's recovering from surgery. They've got the physiological phase, which is kind of baseline home cage recording. And then they've got the experimental phase where they were doing some experimental manipulations of the animals. Uh, but the take home really is that that you get a really nice stable um, pressure signal or ICP signal across these animals um, at very low pressure and the tight error bars uh, reflect that and how accurate these pressure sensors uh, actually are even at such low pressure. So the final feature I'm going to just talk about very quickly is the uh, co-housing mode that we offer. So this gives users the option to simultaneously record from two implanted rats that can be housed together in one cage. So that has uh, significant animal welfare benefits. Um, the rats don't particularly like being housed on their own for telemetry studies. So, so being able to put two rats and, and record from both rats is, is quite valuable. Uh, but an alternative is that you can record from two telemeters implanted in one rat. Uh, so that allows you to mix and match between any of the seven telemeter models currently available and record up to four parameters to create really unique experiments. Um, the rats have to be 350 grams for this, so they have to be quite large rats, but it's a really valuable um, feature. And uh, as a nice example of this, these guys at the University of Auckland in uh, New Zealand uh, published this data, this data where they were recording uh, using a TRM54P uh, P dual pressure telemeter and one of our TR57Y tissue oxygen telemeters. So they're recording um, in an ischemic uh, stroke model in rats uh, and they were able to record mean arterial blood pressure, intracranial blood pressure or intracranial pressure rather and uh, brain tissue oxygen as well. Um, so you're getting a unique combination of parameters for really, um, you know, really stretching the possibilities of your studies and they're also maximizing the use of each animal as well, which I think is a really important thing. So that's it. Uh, like I say, that's uh, quite a short uh, presentation just to emphasize some of the uh, benefits of the pressure recording with the telemetry system. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to find out more information, it's available on the AD Instruments website, um, uh, where there are some more webinar recordings and surgical videos and things. Contact your local AD Instruments uh, representative uh, for more information. And if also, please feel free to contact me if you would, uh, would like to ask some questions. And I'll just leave this slide up with the uh, features and benefits. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, thank all of the speakers for excellent talks today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Nina Stackenfeld uh, for putting together the session and great, graciously allowing me to co-chair the session with her. And um, I, I um, you know, this is a great kickoff to EB next week, so I look forward to excellent talks and, and seeing you all virtually. Um, so thank you, uh, AD Instruments, APS, and um, that I will sign up. Thanks everybody for coming and thank, uh, thanks to all the speakers.